We are continuing our studies in the book of Romans, and we are in Romans chapter 9. And this morning we're going to look at verses 6 through 13. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Good news. It is good news. So why is it that some believe it, some believe the gospel and others don't? How do we explain the spiritual divide among people, among friends, within families? Two college students attend a Christian meeting. One understands the message of salvation in Jesus Christ and believes the other leaves unimpressed and unbelieving. Two sisters grow up in the same household, go to church every Sunday, hear the same Bible stories, are taught the same prayers by their parents, but one believes and the other doesn't. Why is that? Why do two people with the same advantages and opportunities respond in completely different ways? Is the believing brother or sister just smarter than the unbelieving one? It's a question we have and one the early church had as well, particularly over the widespread unbelief of the Jews, the very ones Paul said the gospel is for first of all. Why did they not believe? They began Believing things began so well. You look at the book of Acts, second chapter, which gives us the history of the church, and Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people believed, and we're told daily people were being added to the church. Daily, Jews were believing the gospel. Within a short time, the church was a large minority in Jerusalem and growing. And then came persecution. The church was scattered, but didn't die. It only spread. The gospel went west from synagogue to synagogue and beyond to penetrate even pagan temples and draw Gentiles into the church. In fact, within a generation, the church changed from being predominantly Jewish to being mainly Gentile. As Gentiles received the gospel and Jews rejected it. What happened? God had made promises to Israel of a kingdom and salvation, but the Jews had largely rejected their Messiah and the salvation that they were promised. Had God changed his mind about the Jews? Had his word failed? This is the question that Paul answers in the portion of Romans that we are now in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, it concerns the problem of Jewish unbelief, but has direct relevance for us, for the church, because if God's promises failed for Israel, well, they may fail for the church as well. Can God be trusted? Is His word unbreakable 
Is it reliable? Paul's answer is yes. God can always be trusted. His word has not failed. His promises are unfailing and his purpose is completely unhindered. But as Paul explains, God's promises were not made to all the physical descendants of Abraham. They were made to his elect, those chosen for salvation and who believed. This is the answer to the larger question of why two people within the, with the same advantages and opportunities respond completely differently to the same gospel. It's not because one is smarter than the other. It's not because the message failed or the, the preacher wasn't clear in his explanation. We, certainly we need to be, be clear. There's no virtue or advantage in confusion. But the reason some receive the gospel and others don't, the only reason anyone receives it is because of divine election. That was the reason for the division in the family of Israel, the reason for the division among the Jewish people. That's the explanation that Paul gives in verse 6. God's word, he says, did not fail. God never promised salvation to every Israelite. For, he writes, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In other words, there have always been two kinds of Israelites. Those who are physical Israelites only, and those physical Israelites who are also spiritual Israelites. God's promise, all the glorious promises that he has given of a kingdom and that which is to come are to the spiritual Israelites who received the promise through faith in the gospel. This is what Paul referred to earlier in chapter 2 when he spoke of the true Jew. It's been some time since we were in chapter 2, but there he says that uh, he is not one outwardly in the flesh, but one inwardly. It doesn't mean he's not outwardly a Jew. He certainly is. He has all the physical, natural characteristics of a Jew, but what really makes him a Jew ultimately is what's inward. Salvation. Circumcision is a blessing, but it doesn't save. None of the, the many blessings that Paul listed and that we looked at last week at the top of this uh, ninth chapter, none of those saved Israelites any more than baptism saves a Christian or Bible study will save us. Those are good things and necessary things, but they don't save. Now, most of Paul's contemporaries, his, his Jewish associates believed that those blessings that were mentioned at the beginning did guarantee salvation and that all uh, of Abraham's descendants through Isaac and Jacob were Israelites who would inherit God's promised blessings. But as Paul explains, there is an Israel within Israel. It is what Paul calls the Israel of God in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16. These are the Jewish people to whom the promises belong. And Paul supports this distinction between those who are physical Israelites only and those who are spiritual Israelites and explains it in verses 7 through 13. Salvation has always been based on God's grace in his sovereign election. Paul proves that by going back to the beginning of Israel's history to the patriarchs, to Isaac and Jacob. And actually, uh, this began with Abraham and God's choice of him. God called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans when, according to Joshua, he was not seeking the Lord. Rather, he and his fathers were worshiping idols. So it was when he was in idolatry, when he was in darkness, that God chose that God called him out of that. So Israel's history really began with unconditional election with Abraham, though Paul doesn't begin there. And perhaps because the Jews would have recognized that their origin was in God's choice of Abraham. 
they would have known that. They would have recognized it. God chose Abraham, and, and they believed that because he was the because he was chosen by God, they believed that, that that guaranteed their salvation as well because they were his descendants. They were descendants of the chosen one. Well, Paul doesn't begin with Abraham. He begins with his descendants to make his point. And the first one he begins with is Abraham's son Isaac to show that physical descent is not enough. And every Jew would have had to agree because Abraham had two sons, you remember. God said, through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Now, Paul doesn't mention the other one. He doesn't name Ishmael, but he certainly alluded to, implied here from God's choice of Isaac, which proves that it is distinguishing grace, not natural birth, that determines Abraham's spiritual offspring. It says in verse 8 through 9, It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. It would be a miracle that Sarah would have a son because Sarah was barren. God promised Abraham children, but... For years, he had had none. Sarah was the problem. So she sought to remedy the problem. She offered Abraham her Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, the slave. And by her, Abraham had his first son, Ishmael. It was assumed that the promise given to Abraham would be fulfilled through him. And he'd have many descendants through Ishmael. But 13 years later, God told Abraham that the son of promise would not come through Hagar. He would come through Sarah. Well, by now, Abraham was past the age of producing children, and Sarah was still barren. It seemed an impossibility. When Sarah heard that she would have a son, you remember, she laughed in disbelief. It seemed a complete impossibility. But that was the point, the very point of God's timing in all of this. Isaac would be born by the power of God, not by the natural strength of Abraham. He would be an example of God's grace, a child of grace. A year later he was born, and then in Genesis 21, verse 12, the Lord said to Abraham, Through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And Ishmael and Hagar were sent away from the family. Ishmael was a natural son. He was Abraham's firstborn. He had even been circumcised. By all human standards, he would have been the chosen heir. He was assumed to have been the heir. But he was not. Isaac was. The child of grace. God's sovereign choice. Ishmael was sent away proving, as someone has said, what counts is grace, not race. But someone might object that the reason Ishmael was rejected was because his mother was an Egyptian and a slave and not Sarah. He was, he was not of pure parentage, and Isaac was. And also, the promise about Isaac was made well after the birth of Ishmael. God had seen the sort of person that Ishmael was, a wild ass of a man, and rejected him because he was unworthy. And so Paul now answers these objections, objections of parentage, objections of merit, in verses 10 through 12 with proof from the next generation, the twins born to Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. Both children had the same mother and father, so they had the appropriate parents. That couldn't be an objection. And very different destinies that were revealed, prophesied before either one was born. Verse 10, 
And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Well, that answers all the objections about parents and about merit. It is the scriptural proof of divine election taken from Genesis 25, verses 19 through 26. And like Isaac's birth, it shows God's sovereign grace. Rebekah was barren like Sarah. The couple was unable to have children. Isaac, Isaac, we're told, prayed for his wife. In fact, he prayed for many, many years. Twenty years he prayed for Rebekah that she would bear children. So that period of time showed that this was something impossible for them to do. What would occur in the birth of their children was the work of God alone. But I think it's worth noting the fact that, that Isaac prayed for her, prayed earnestly, prayed over a long period of time, which illustrates an important point. Predestination, divine election is not contrary to prayer. It's one of the objections that's raised against it. If predestination is true, if election is true, then why pray? Why pray for salvation? Why pray for anything? Prayer, in fact, is the very means that God has given us to obtain the blessings that he's predestined for us. So, we should pray that God would give his blessings to us and that people would believe Pray that the elect would be saved. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer. He'll answer our prayers. And in this context, the prayer that was answered was that Rebecca would be pregnant, and she was pregnant with twins. And as they grew, the children began to struggle within her womb, we were told. And she became alarmed. It was obviously a very distinct kind of uh, struggle that was going on, something that was unusual. And so she asked the Lord about it, and he answered her with an explanation. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, those who object to the doctrine of unconditional election take the statement, two nations, as indicating that this is about national election and temporal blessing. It's not about personal election or eternal life. Well, it does have to do with nations, but the last statement, the older shall serve the younger, makes it... Uh, plain that fundamentally this is about two individuals, those two boys, those two brothers. It's about their individual election and about spiritual blessing. Again, the choice was contrary to custom in the ancient world, which gave preference to the firstborn. He was to be the natural heir, but there was no natural advantage here in the birth that influenced God's choice, he chose contrary to all of that, contrary to what is humanly expected. And his choice of Jacob was made before either child had done anything good or bad. It wasn't determined upon their lives and what they would do, what they would choose, how they would act, which is to say this choice was completely unconditional. It had nothing to do with merit of any kind. God's choice of Jacob over Esau did not take account of either one's natural abilities or religious devotion or their faith. Nothing about them influenced God's choice. It was sovereign and free, and it happened this way so that, Paul says, God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, 
but because of him who calls. Works do not enter into this. It's according to his will. Him who calls. Well, what was God's purpose? It's his plan of salvation. It was not formed in time. It is an eternal plan. Election. In fact, all of God's choices were made before time and made in order to fulfill his plan. That's what Paul says. So that God's purpose would stand. If it had not been all of him, if God's plan had depended in some way upon us, upon our works or our faith or our faithfulness, then his purpose would not stand. And his word would certainly have failed because we would have failed and we do fail. That's the reason that election must be unconditional. It must be according to God's sovereign and free choice. Yet many people see it differently and in fact turn the doctrine of election upside down. The Arminians reject unconditional election for what is called conditional election. That is stated in their early confession of faith called the Remonstrance. And the first article of that confession of faith is entitled Conditional Predestination. It states, and this is a quote, election and condemnation are conditioned by foreknowledge and made dependent on foreseen faith or unbelief of men. In other words, God elects his saints in the same way that we elect our politicians. We see something in them that we like and so we vote for them. But Paul said that God's election of Jacob and rejection of Esau occurred before either one was born, before either one had done anything good or bad. Election is not conditioned upon us. It's not conditioned upon what we do. It's not conditioned on us in any way. Now God, of course, has foreknowledge. He knows everything from beginning to end. He is omniscient. It's one of his great attributes. But he knows all things because he's planned all things from all eternity. What he knows is his plan, which is all-encompassing. But if it were so that God chose people based on foreknowledge or prescience, which means pre-science, pre-knowledge, if it were true that he looked down through time and he chose those he saw who would believe then who would be saved? Now, this is an issue we looked at a few weeks ago when we were studying Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 29 and 30, when we dealt with the word foreknowledge there and saw that it doesn't mean knowing beforehand. It, it means for love. But, but the idea of foreknowledge, of, of prescience, of knowing beforehand is true. God knows everything ahead of time. And so taking that as, as a correct idea and applying it to this, what would God have seen if his choice of his people were based upon foreseen faith or foreseen good works of some kind? Well, we go back as we did a few weeks ago to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul wrote, and this is not just Paul's statement. Paul's actually quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting David, the Psalms. But he wrote there that there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. None. Not one. Well, that being so, what would God have seen to choose from? God would have chosen no one because he would not have seen anyone understanding. He would not have seen anyone seeking for him. That's what Paul says. That's what David said. That's what the Old and New Testament say. Men do not naturally seek God at all. 
There's a story about an old Christian who frequently testified, I was saved partly by God's work and partly by mine. And people were puzzled by that, and then he explained, I resisted, God did the rest. That's true. Paul makes it, makes it very clear that election is not based on anything in us. It is according to God's choice. He's speaking here about Israel and what happened to Israel. But what is true of them is true of all of us. It's true of the doctrine of election as it applies to everyone. It is according to God's choice. It is according to His will alone. His election is unconditional. That is the only way that it could stand. Now, Paul concludes with a final quotation of Scripture. Just as, is, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, that's taken from Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2, where God affirms his love for Israel by recalling his choice of, of them, of Jacob's descendants, over Israel. Edom, which are Esau's descendants. He loved Jacob, and God hated Esau. That statement is jarring on the face of it, but it's not to be understood in the sense that God had uh, animosity or malice toward Esau. It's, it has the same sense in which Jesus used the word hate in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, where he said that we cannot be his disciples unless we hate our family. Well, that's a, a, an astonishing statement. Hate our mother and father and our brothers and sisters? Why would he demand that? Well, that doesn't mean that we are to be hostile toward our family. It means that we are to put Christ above our family. It's put in that stark way that jarring way to make the point very clearly. We are to choose Him over all others. So it has the idea of love less. And that's the meaning here. God put Jacob above Esau. As individuals, not just as nations. He chose Jacob and rejected Esau. And God's only motivation for doing that is love, for love, eternal love, unconditional love, electing love. Is that unfair? It certainly seems unfair to a lot of people. Is it? Well, not at all. How can it be considered unfair for God to save undeserving people if that is His desire? People who don't deserve to be saved, who deserve to be rejected. We are all born in our sin. We're all born guilty and undeserving and in rebellion against God, and none are seeking Him. Why is it unfair if God should choose any at all? He doesn't choose just a few, He chooses a lot. Plus, Paul explains in verse 15, election is due to God's mercy alone. It, it is reason not to be angry or even be confused. If we understand the nature of man, if we understand the reality about the human race, its fall, its rebellion, this is not a reason to call out uh, a, 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 an injustice against God, rather to be full of joy and gratitude. It's certainly no basis for pride either. That's often the objection to the doctrine of election. It's, it's a prideful doctrine. Uh, we're the chosen few, and so the Calvinists are considered to be a prideful people, an arrogant people, and I, I will confess I've known some pretty arrogant or prideful Calvinists, but that's, that's not because of doctrine, that's because of personality. Rightly understood, unconditional election produces the opposite. What do we have to be proud of? God chose no one because of his or her birth or because of his or her works. 
choice, God's choice of us was not based upon anything within us that would merit His choice. But Paul made this point to the, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. They had a problem with pride, you remember. They had a number of problems, but one of them that he addresses early in the book in chapter 4 is their pride. And so Paul asked, who regards you as superior? They really thought they were superior. Okay, who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And he writes, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? The, the question he's asking there is rhetorical. The, the, the answers to his questions are obvious. Nothing. You have nothing that you did not receive. Everything is a gift. Even your faith is a gift. You can't take credit for anything. That's what he's telling the Corinthians, and it's true of us as well. So there's no ground of boasting in, in, in ourselves for any of us. Our boast is in Christ alone, in God's sovereign and free grace that he has extended to the undeserving and the helpless. Nevertheless, these are some of the objections to election that are commonly cited against it. it. It produces pride or it leads to indifference toward godliness and it hinders the gospel. How many times have I heard that objection? Well, you can't preach the gospel if you believe in election or predestination. Well, let me try to answer some of these briefly in the time we have left. First, that unconditional election fosters apathy in the Christian life. Both Peter and Paul say that election is to obedience and good works. We've not simply been chosen, elected from all eternity to salvation, elected from all eternity to eternity. Our election is to faith. Our election is to good works. Our election is to a different life altogether. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it said that we were chosen to obey Jesus Christ. Chosen for faith. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says that we were created in Christ for good works. Election invigorates spiritually, morally. And, and history has given support to that. In his book, the Age of the Reformation, Preserved Smith, who was no champion of Calvinism at all, gives testimony to its vitality and morality. After giving a harsh critique of the doctrine of election, he writes that there was another side to it as seen in what it produced in those who held to it. He writes, there was a certain moral grandeur in the complete abandon to God and in the earnestness that was ready to sacrifice all to his will. What he's saying is these Calvinists that he's describing were completely given over to God, given to God and to obedience to him because of their understanding of the doctrine of election. And if we judge the tree by its fruits, he writes, at its best, it brought forth a strong and good race, the rank and file of the Huguenots of France, the Puritans of England, the choice and sifted seed wherewith God sowed the wilderness of America. And he's talking there of those Scots and Scots-Irish, the Presbyterians who were trained on the Westminster Confession of Faith who went west and uh, the wilderness, as he said, and settled it. These men bore themselves with I know not what of lofty seriousness and a matchless disdain of all the mortal peril and all earthly grandeur. Believing themselves chosen vessels and elect instruments of grace, they could neither be seduced by carnal pleasure nor awed by human might. So election brought with it moral discipline and courage. Now that, that was honest if grudging praise and true. 
those who truly understand the sovereignty of God increasingly become abandoned to God. And their earnestness is witnessed in evangelism. The doctrine of election and belief that salvation is t entirely the work of God, one, is the teaching of the Word of God. The end of Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2 is salvation is of the Lord from beginning to end. But believing that is not only believing what the Bible teaches, but it is a belief that does not undermine the gospel. Everyone is born into this world lost and in need of the Savior. And everyone is responsible to understand that and believe. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sovereignty of God does not eliminate the, the responsibility of man. The elect must believe to be saved. Election, though, is the guarantee that they will. Because without it, no one will. And the fact that salvation is God's work, that we sow the seed, but God gives the growth, is actually incentive to go out and proclaim the gospel. His elect are there, and they will respond. The doctrine of election was a, a great spur to Paul in his mission to the Gentiles. He told Timothy, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. I endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. And election has, has been motivation for many others. It's been motivation for people down through the ages. Charles Spurgeon is one. He's a great example because Spurgeon, the great preacher of the uh, 19th century was a five-point Calvinist and an evangelist, a soul winner. He had no difficulty preaching election and the gospel. And to those who, who worried about election, he said, if you love to be saved by Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ elected you to be saved. If you do desire to have salvation, you are elected to have it if you desire it sincerely and earnestly. But if you don't desire it, why on earth should you be so preposterously foolish as to grumble because God gives that which you do not like to other people? Good point. Do you want to be saved? Well, then believe. Election hinders no one from coming to the gospel. It's the reason all who come do come. It answers the question of why it is that some believe the gospel and others don't. Why two people who have the same opportunities, the same advantages, respond so differently? Why Jacob desired his birthright and Esau despised it? God has chosen one, not the other. It is his sovereign right to do so. It's not unjust because we are all guilty and undeserving. It's merciful. Merciful. So if you are lost and you want to be found, then believe in Jesus Christ. Trust in him for salvation as the one who died in the place of sinners as was sung this morning and bore the penalty as our substitute. The Lord receives all who do. He casts none out. He turns none away. So believe, and in doing so, discover that you're one of His elect. May God help you to do that and encourage all of us. His love for us is eternal and unfailing. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for what Paul has written here. He's explaining this problem of Jewish unbelief and showing that his promises have not failed. Your promises have not failed. But he's talking about us as well. If we're a believer in Jesus Christ, whether we understand it or not, it's because of your eternal love, 
and your eternal choice of a people. Father, we give you praise and thanks for that. This doctrine of election, as I said, is no hindrance to salvation, no hindrance to people coming through faith to Jesus Christ. It rather opens the door. So we give you praise and thanks that even when we were lost in ruin, you set your love upon us, chose us, and brought us into your family. We give, all, we give you all the praise. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.